Hi guys, I'm Kaylee. Thanks for joining us. When we first had our daughter Ember, my husband was the field strategy director at Global Aid Network and his job would take him all over the world pretty frequently, a few times a year to do water wells or disaster relief, things like that. And when Ember was young, the experience of Rob being gone was sometimes very upsetting to her. Um, she would walk around the house as a toddler going, I lost my daddy, which was so sad. Uh, one of the reasons he took another job, God bless him. Um, but sometimes when he was traveling uh, and I would get her up in the morning, she would soothe herself by when I came into the room, she would look at me and say, daddy's downstairs. And I would have to say, oh, no, baby, I'm so sorry. He's he's still on his trip. Um, meanwhile, I'm tearing up and she would she would try to comfort me and say, it's OK, mommy. Daddy's downstairs soon. And I thought that was just the sweetest thing. Until um, one day I'm putting her down to bed and uh, she had taken a bath. We did, we read the book together um, and she just wants to cuddle with me for a little while before I put her down. And so she snuggles up right next to me, puts her little cheek against my cheek. And then she begins to whisper in my ear, daddy's downstairs, daddy's downstairs, daddy's downstairs. So that was about the most terrifying 15 minutes of my life. Just straight out of a Jordan Peele film. Time was relative to Ember. Uh, it was somewhat meaningless because she didn't, she couldn't read a clock. She didn't know the difference between taking a nap or sleeping through the night. And so if she's happy and her needs are met, time flies. But when she's sick or hungry or when daddy's on a trip, time can seem interminably slow. And of course, the longer things take, the harder it is for me to convince her that those good things are still coming. The book of Malachi is easy to find because it's the last book uh, of the Old Testament before the New Testament begins. And along with Ezra and Nehemiah, we find in Malachi some of the last direct words from God before the intertestamental period, that, that period of 400 years of silence between the last words of the prophecy of Malachi and the first words of Matthew. And for this reason, sometimes Malachi is called the prophet of the waiting period. Last week, Michael walked us through the promises of God's coming arrival, that he would be God with us, Emmanuel, who would carry the government on his shoulders and be a mighty God, a wonderful counselor, an everlasting father, a prince of peace. And these were incredible promises, but it's important to remember that they were made some 700 years before Jesus arrives on the scene. And in the interim, between when the promises were made and between when they were fulfilled in Jesus, some terrible things happened to God's people. 586 BC, Jerusalem is conquered by Babylon and God's temple is destroyed, burned to the ground. This is the temple where, where the Shekinah glory of God, the actual glory cloud would settle over the Holy of Holies and God's presence could be seen and felt visibly by his people. This is the temple where priests had to go through all kinds of cleansing rituals before they could step into that inner sanctum or else they would literally be killed by the holiness of God. That temple was destroyed by Babylon. And then the people were carried off as plunder. And then after that, Babylon is conquered by the Persians. Eventually, the Persian emperor Cyrus allows the people to return and rebuild their temple, which they finish at about 515 BC. But to their dismay, the glory cloud, the glory of the Lord, never returned to the second temple the way that they thought it would. The glory cloud doesn't settle over the Holy of Holies. There's no smoke and no fire and no radiance and no glory. It is just an empty room. And every time the people look at that empty room, they grieve the absence of their God who they expected to show up again. And then fast forward another 70 years to the end of the book of Malachi, the people are heartsick from waiting and they're beginning to become resentful. There, there is a, there, there's a, a, an edge to the dialogue between God and his people in the book of Malachi. Generations were dying without seeing these promises fulfilled and people are asking, does it even matter? Does it even matter if we serve God? Or in the words of them in Malachi themselves, what is the profit of our keeping his charge? The people have been waiting so long that it became harder and harder for them to believe that the promises were still coming. And then 400 years of silence. Malachi, end scene. The scholar Baldwin writes, Malachi's prophecy is particularly relevant to the many waiting periods in human history and in the lives of individuals. He enables us to see the strains and temptations of such times, the imperceptible abrasion of faith that ends in cynicism because it has lost touch with the living God. What do we do with delayed expectations? Or perhaps... 
More pointedly, what do delayed expectations do with us? How do we hold on to hope when we don't know when or how God will show up again? There is a miserable gap, I think, for all of us between the moment when a prayer is prayed and when it is answered. The prayer we pray for healing, for a child, for a job, for a relationship. We pray these prayers and they go up to heaven, but then there is a gap because we see only through a glass dimly. There's a gap. We don't know what that prayer looks like on the other side of heaven. We only understand our sense of time. And this is not unique to us. These, this is the decades long prayer of Sarah whose womb would not open until she was an old woman. This is the decades long prayer of the Israelites to be released from captivity. These are the prayers, the Psalms of the Old Testament saying, how long Lord, how long will you hide your face from me? There's always a gap between when the prayer is prayed and when it's answered. And as Michael pointed out last week, we have a choice about what we do in that space of time. As we wait for God to fulfill the promises that he most certainly will fulfill, but not yet, what do we do in the gap? Do we just watch? Do we wait or do we participate? Do we wait for heaven to come to us or do we try to pull it down to earth? Are we spectators or are we seekers of God and his promises to us? So today I want us to look at two different people that had been waiting for Emmanuel, God with us. Two men who were promised that they would see the Messiah and two men who had very different approaches to how they would spend their time in the gap between when the promise was made and when it was fulfilled. So our first story is about a man named Zechariah. You may know him as the dad of John the Baptist, the eccentric cousin of Jesus who ate locusts and wild honey and lived in the desert and, 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 and preached repentance and preparing the way for Jesus in his earthly ministry. His dad was Zechariah. In the series, The Chosen, uh, the other, some of the other apostles call him Creepy John, which makes me laugh every time. He wasn't creepy. He was enthusiastic. Uh, so this is Luke chapter one, beginning in verse five. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive and they were both very old. One day Zechariah was serving, in God, serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that day. And while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son and you are to name him Creepy John. Just kidding. It only says John, not the other part. <laughs> you will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine nor other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the, the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man, and my wife is also well along in years. It's very diplomatic of him. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born for my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. How can I be sure this will happen? Zechariah asks. Hope by definition, is the confidence that certain expectations will be fulfilled. Every time we jump, we put hope in gravity that we won't float off into space. Every time we board a plane, we put our hope into aeronautical engineering that we won't crash to the ground instead of continue to fly. When we buy milk, we hope that the expiration date is accurate and that, that's all fine, but hope can also be misplaced. You know, uh, we put hope in expensive beauty products that they, we think maybe they'll make my 
41-year-old skin look like it's 20 again. Every bad romantic Christmas movie uh, that airs this time of year sets up terrible expectations that are bound to crush people's hope. Uh, we were watching a, a Christmas Prince or a Prince for Christmas or Christmas Royal. Well, they're all they're all the same. They all have the same plot line. Um, and at the end of the movie, my husband turns to me and says, listen, when a man says I've been keeping something from you, it is never that he's a prince. <laughs> Hallmark has really laid some heavy expectations on the backs of lumberjacks everywhere uh, in that way. Hope, the confidence that an expectation will be fulfilled can be a good thing provided that the object of our hope is reliable. What we put our hope in determines whether we are ultimately fulfilled or disappointed. Zechariah is presented with an angel from heaven who comes to him and says, your, your prayers have been answered. You're going to have a son and not just any son. He's going to be this incredible man. He's going to prepare the way for Messiah. And Zechariah's immediate response is to ask the angel for proof. As if an angel from heaven is not sufficient proof. I have to imagine the angel is like, my guy, I just appeared from thin air. I am literally on fire, but you need proof. Okay, Zechariah, he no longer held out hope that God's promises would be fulfilled. He was, he was righteous and devout. He absolutely was. It says that right there in the scripture. He did the duties of his station admirably, but he no longer believed that life held much more than get up, go to work, go to temple, pray the prayers, eat dinner, go to sleep, get up, go to work, go to temple, pray the prayers, eat dinner, go to sleep. And honestly, my heart goes out to Zechariah because he was an old man. He had lived a lot of life and we, he had been wearied not only by waiting for the Messiah, but we learn in the story, he was also waiting for his own child too and had given up hope that that was even a possibility. Maybe he'd been conditioned by his disappointment to be fearful of hope. I mean, there are certainly times that that's been true in my life. I'm sure some of you can understand that intimately as well. You know, some of you have spent the better part of your lives waiting to be a mother. And now that you are, you don't know where you went. And your life is diapers and midnight feedings and arguments about whose turn it is. And you're feeling like who you are apart from this baby has been lost. And you don't know if it's ever going to come back. Some of you have been waiting for the one and you finally found them but the drinking has gotten so out of control that the things that you call normal, you know in the back of your mind other people would call chaos. And it's hard because you're wondering if this could really be what you spent all that time waiting for. Some of you are waiting for the remission of your illness and you're waiting for God to make good on all these promises because you're holding up your end of the bargain. You're reading your Bible. You're saying your prayers. You're not, you, you know, you're not getting wasted. You're giving tithes. You're not sleeping around. You're not even smoking most of the time, but you're not getting better. And you feel like someone has been lying to you. I get it. I have lived through seasons of life that I wanted so badly for something to happen that I couldn't pray for it because I was afraid that if God said no, it would absolutely destroy my faith. Disappointment can beat us up. I know it can. Even Zechariah's son, John the Baptist, who Jesus gives a shout out to in the Bible, says he's just one of a kind in all the world. Even he gets beat up by disappointment. He expected Jesus to come in and kick down some doors and overthrow the Roman oppressors with glory and power. And so instead, when Jesus preaches forgiveness and love of your enemies, it rocks John's faith. Are you going to show up, God? because this is not what I expected you showing up would look like. And when John is thrown into prison, he sends word to Jesus to ask, are you the one coming or should we expect something else, someone else? That's not, a, that's not a question someone asks because they're uncertain. John knew who Jesus was. That's a question asked in pain. He's in pain. And so is his dad, Zechariah, who barely has it in him to believe that an old woman could get pregnant because promises never seem to arrive and it's become painful and he begins to wonder if they're still coming. Or in the words of Proverbs 13, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Their faith is shaky, but Jesus knows how they got there. He knows, he's not mad. He's not threatened by their questions, nor might I add, is he threatened by yours. He does not want to punish us for what pain has done to our expectations. 
And in fact, God is so tender with broken hearts that even in his unbelief, Zechariah is still given the blessing. He still receives his son, his grief is over, his wife's shame is removed, but there is a joy that he misses out on by allowing his hope to be smothered and adopting this wait and see posture, choosing to become a, a, a passive spectator of the promises of God. Zechariah spent nine months in silence instead of celebrating with his loved ones, nine months in silence instead of singing lullabies to that beautiful miraculous baby bump, nine months of silence instead of recalling with his family all of the promises that God had made, keeping the hope alive together to make the long, long wait for Messiah less painful. How can I be sure this will happen? That's a question without hope. I'd rather not get my hopes up. I'd rather wait and see than get my hopes up again only to maybe be disappointed. I get it, but he misses out on the joy in the present that God's future promises can offer us. Joy in the present that can give meaning to get up, go to work, go to temple, say the prayers, eat the dinner, go to bed, the quotidian rhythms that all creatures must do. Zechariah gets the blessing. God always makes good on his promises, but there's a joy he misses out on. And there's a joy that we miss out on when we allow our hope to be smothered too. Waiting can damage our hope if we're not constantly bringing our grief and our longings back to God in prayer and relationship with Jesus. If we don't do that, waiting will diminish our hope. I don't think Zechariah, I don't think he expected too much of God and got disappointed. I think in the end, he expected too little. He wanted God to save Israel when in fact God had planned to save the whole world. He wanted a child who would take away his wife's shame. And God sent a child who would take away the shame of the entire world. He let waiting make his hope too small, but it doesn't have to. Our second story today is about another man called Simeon. Very little is actually known about Simeon. Only four bits of information we get here in the Bible, that he was a man in Jerusalem, that he is devout and upright, and that he is waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit is upon him. There's lots of traditions that say that Simeon uh, was a priest uh, and an old man, and those could be true. Uh, we don't know. There's one tradition uh, that suggests that he was one of the 70 scholars that translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, so uh, what's called the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and that in that translation, he translated Isaiah 7, 14 as saying a young woman will conceive rather than a virgin will conceive because he thought that was crazy and he didn't believe it. And then the tradition says that the Holy Spirit told him he wouldn't die until he saw the Messiah because he didn't believe it. That would make Simeon about 350 years old when the Gospel of Luke was written. This is all extra biblical, by the way. Uh, I'm not telling you that's what happened. I just enjoyed that story. And maybe it's one of the reasons that people think he's an old man and a priest. But we don't know that. What we know is that Simeon is a man in Jerusalem. He is devout and upright, and he is waiting for the consolation of Israel. That is a quote from the book of Isaiah. So whether he was three, 350 years old or 35, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the Messiah to arrive on earth. I want you to listen to what Luke says about him on the day of uh, baby Jesus's dedication. This is Luke chapter two, beginning in verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When his parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon 
even if he was an old man, remembers the promises God made and not even fresh promises, right? Zechariah gets a fresh promise from a live and in-person angel. Simeon is just remembering here old promises. Isaiah promises that God made to his people that he would send the comforter, the wonderful counselor, and a promise made to Simeon himself that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Christ. There is no angel who announces the birth of Jesus to Simeon. Luke simply says, moved by the spirit, he went into the temple courts. Simeon walked in step with the Holy Spirit, listening for his prompts and whispers, and Simeon went looking for Jesus. He was not a spectator. He was not a passive observer of God's promises. He was a seeker. He actively sought out the child Jesus and he found him. Simeon went looking for Jesus and he finds what he's been looking for all his life. And not only does he find him, but he receives the gift of holding this child, pronouncing, using his own voice to pronounce a blessing over the Messiah and his bewildered parents who would no doubt need that encouragement for all the struggles and trials that would come. The word Advent means arrival. And the Advent season is when we prepare to celebrate Jesus' arrival on earth. He arrived that first Christmas for the first time. It was his first, but not his last advent. He's coming back, guys. He's coming back on clouds descending, bringing the new heavens and earth along with him, refined, perfected into the paradise that it was meant to be. And the child you lost will run to greet you. And the father who struggled will be free of his demons and those who left this world limping will run and leap and there will be no death and no tears and there will never be waiting ever, ever again. But there is a gap, a miserable gap between his first advent and his final. And you and I live in that gap and we live here knowing that the wonderful counselor and the Prince of Peace is on his way back, but he's not back yet. So what do we do? What do you and I do in the gap? We can insulate ourselves with our creature comforts. We can anesthetize ourselves and our feelings with cocktails and Netflix, numbing out the pain of life in the gap. And we can wait and see how God finally chooses to show up. But if we do that, I imagine we will see very little of God along the way. Or you and I can go looking for Jesus. And we can do that by bringing our grief and our longings to him every single day, keeping in step with his spirit, listening for his promptings, his whispers. And if we do that, I imagine you and I will see a great deal of God as we wait for him in the gap, in places and times that we least expect it. Either way, we will have to get up, go to work, go to church, pray the prayers, eat the dinner, wash the kids, go to bed. We will have to live in the gap near to Jesus or far from him, but near to him. Those mundane everyday rhythms can start to hold meaning, even joy. A lot of people I work with uh, run. Some of them have done marathons, multiple marathons. And I always felt pressure to try it. So back in 2020, I ran my first race in just under four hours. Um, it was a 5K, but still, I'm just kidding. It was a 5K and I ran it in about 35 minutes, which is super slow, but it was a big accomplishment for me personally because I have an autoimmune arthritis, uh, which causes joint damage for me and pain. And secondarily, because I hate running, uh, only slightly less than I hate porcelain dolls. And I didn't tell anybody that I was training for this race because I knew that with my arthritis, there was a possibility that I'd have a flare and have to stop and I didn't wanna be embarrassed by quitting in the middle. So I started um, training in secret. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, I think the hardest part of establishing a regular exercise routine is like the first two months, the first few weeks, that are just kind of miserable and painful. And it's really easy to quit within that period of time. 
But if you quit and then you wait a while and then you start again, you have to go through those miserable few weeks again, almost as if you're doing it for the first time. Uh, and so even if all of your exercise time cumulative cumulatively adds up to years of your life, you've really only experienced the worst parts of exercise, not the parts where it starts to feel good and it makes you gives you energy or whatever that nonsense is. Does that make sense? And so with my arthritis, I felt almost doomed into this cycle sometimes because I would, I would make progress, I thought. I would build up strength and then I'd have a flare and I'd have to stop. And then I would have to wait for a period of time till I healed and then I would have to go through that miserable few weeks over and over again. And over time, uh, that just kind of wore me down, especially in the early years of my diagnosis. And as a result, I, I'm not generally very motivated to exercise or to try new types of exercise. Um, and it can feel pretty hopeless sometimes. So about six months before that 5K, I'm having a conversation with my husband, Rob, and uh, I said something that kind of revealed that I didn't really have a lot of hope for myself physically. Um, not that I would ever be like a pro CrossFit or anything like that, I, even if I didn't have arthritis, but I just didn't have any hope that my physical condition could be improved. And I kind of had this attitude of like, well, I'm just going to keep disintegrating into nothing. Um, and, and it was, it was pretty brutal. It was, uh, it, it was sad and disappointing. And this pushed some kind of button in my husband's heart. Um, and he started to argue with me about having hope about the fact that I should try to have hope. And this is very out of character for him. He has always been nothing but generous and kind, um, especially with regard to my health challenges. So it kind of took me off guard. <laughs> and he was like, listen, you get up there every time you preach a sermon and you tell people that they should have hope and you're not even willing to try to have it for yourself. And that's not okay. And I was so mad at him. He was right, uh, but I was still mad. That made me even madder, I think. And I was so mad that I didn't even want to reward him by agreeing that he had a point. Uh, so I didn't tell him this, but it was the very next morning that I started the couch to 5K trainer um, for my race. And I still didn't tell him. Then about halfway through, halfway into the training period, he actually caught me uh, red-handed or red-footed, as it were. Um, I had I'd been going out early before anyone else in my house was up and he just happened to wake up super early that morning and he, he, I, I'm walking in the door sweaty with my earbuds in and he's like, where were you? And I was like, uh, running? He's like, why? And I, then I felt like Forrest Gump. I just felt like running. And he's like, well, how, how long have you been running? And I was like, uh, about six weeks. <laughs> but he was right. He was absolutely right. I don't want to live hopelessly. I don't want to just wither away on my couch, slowly losing mobility. And even if it means I have to fight through the miserable weeks of the, the beginning of exercise over and over again, that's still a better existence for me than just stopping moving and waiting. Just waiting for life to come to an end so I can cash in this model for my heavenly upgrade. And I still hate running, but man, it gave me so much hope to run that race. And maybe I will lose mobility in the future, but right now, today, I can still put one foot in front of the other, and that's not nothing. That's still worth celebrating in the present. In my experience with disappointment, it's not this all or nothing moment where you just throw up your hands and say, that's it, God, I'm done. I'm done with you. I'm not gonna hope anymore. No, I think it's, I think it's a sad, slow erosion of trust and intimacy that ends not with a bang, but with a whimper. And what I want you to hear today is don't you dare let the devil smother your hope. Don't you dare let him slowly smother your light by convincing you that there's nothing good for you today, that all hope is deferred. That is a lie. And it's meant to squash your hope one small disappointment at a time. Don't let him. Don't you dare let him leverage the pain that he has already brought into this world by then using it against you to keep you away from the only one who can make you whole. Not all hope is deferred. You can still put one foot in front of the other today. God is not reneging on his promise of ease and comfort. He never promised us those things. I, sometimes I wish he had. But God's not failing. He's not failing to deliver promises that he never made. But the enemy wants desperately to convince us that he has because it's just good strategy. It damages our faith. 
And that's exactly what he wants. He wants us to feel disappointed by God, let down, overlooked, because if we believe that, then we will stop seeking after him because it's too painful. It's too painful. Instead, we'll just wait and see. Wait and see if he shows up. God has made great and glorious promises to us for the future. And on a long enough timeline, every single one of them will be fulfilled. But the reality is not all of those promises were meant for today. Some of them were meant for tomorrow, some for tomorrows that we will never live to see. But God's promise in the present is to be with us. Just to be with us. His advent brought a piece of heaven down to earth to be with us here and now. And God is with Simeon. He's with Zechariah and Zechariah's son. He's with them in spirit, yes, but now even closer. He is with Simeon in his arms because he went looking for Jesus. Are you looking for Jesus this Christmas? Or has your hope been deferred so long that you quit seeking him out? I get it. But remember, we have to live in this gap with or without him. And after every disappointment that I've weathered in my life, I can promise you that with him is better. With him is better. His promises to be with us. And he will see that through. His promises to be with us and he has fulfilled it. He promises to be with us and we will see that he is when we go looking for him. And in fact, we will see that he always has been just maybe not in the ways that we expected. Remember all those sad people in the book of Malachi? Cyrus sent them home to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and they were crushed because the glory cloud never came back and settled on the Holy of Holies the way they expected. The glory of the Lord never returned to the temple and they mourned over it. They mourned over the, the, the temple that they'd built. But do you know that temple that temple is the one into which Mary and Joseph bring the baby Jesus for his dedication. I want to read this passage again. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him, according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. God made good on his promise to return his glory to the temple. Only it comes not in a cloud, but in a child. God always makes good on his promises. His character will not allow otherwise, but not always on our timeline and certainly not always in the way that we expect, but always, always, always in a way that is better and bigger than what we could have imagined for ourselves. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that even in the times in our lives when we are hungry for you and yet not looking, you come looking for us. You don't leave us alone here to weather the storms and the disappointments and the fears and the anxieties alone, but you are ever present. We always have access to you, Lord. We always have a lifeline to you if we'll look. And so Lord, I pray for each and every person listening to these words, that as they walk through this holiday season, where maybe there is an empty chair where there shouldn't be, where maybe they're alone when they thought they would be together. Lord, I pray for each person that you would allow us to feel your presence near, that you would allow us to hold on to the hope that if we look for you, you will be found. You want to be found by us and that there is a place that we can meet you that's sacred and perfect where you'll always be, and it's so close, so close that it's inside. It's inside of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would be near to each of us and that we would feel your presence and that through that we would carry it into the world that so desperately needs to see a glimpse of you so that they might have hope where they have had none. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen. Oh,
The in-between is the most difficult portion of anything because in the in-between is when you start to form expectations of what you want to see. Even when we look at scripture from Old Testament prophecies to the birth of Jesus, that in-between is where we see those expectations, those delayed expectations. And as frustrating as that thing can be, within the middle is where we see the hope of God. Thank you, Kaylee, for such a wonderful reminder. Well, that's all for us here. We wanna say thank you guys for joining us as always. And please remember, as much as we love with engaging with you like this, please know that this is never a substitution for being an actual real community. So we encourage you guys to join us at any of our locations here on Sundays or wherever church is in your close proximity. And don't forget to engage with us on social media, our Instagram or on YouTube. We appreciate you guys. We'll see you next week.